Hi there, my name's Logan. I'm with the Cleveland Comedy Festival. Um, as you probably know, your film uh, for, Mad, for Mad Men Only is uh, co-sponsored by the Cleveland Comedy Festival and the Rocky River Public Library. So just to give you a little bit, bit of background about us, we are, we're a nonprofit here in Cleveland that's been running for about 14 years now. We usually do a festival every October or November. Uh, with COVID happening, obviously last year was a little bit different. We used to be at Playhouse Square and then we shifted to the local comedy club Polarities. And now this year we're kind of more focused on different sorts of media like podcasting and web series um, and just sort of finding different ways to reach out to people, which I'm sure you're used to doing all these film festivals now virtually. Yeah. Uh, on top of that, as a nonprofit, we also teach a lot of comedy. So a lot of this uh, stuff that we're seeing in the documentary about Del Close teaching people improv and just ways to be themselves is something that's uh, a big part of the festival's mission. Kate, who's going to be here asking questions as well, teaches a ton of different programs, a lot of them related to uh, STEM or just reaching out to children and getting people more comfortable, you know, being themselves and being creative in different ways with comedy. So, so that's <laughs> one way that we really like, you know, resonated with the film itself. And then obviously there's uh, the Rocky River Public Library with us. Um, Del Close obviously was an author for the Wasteland comics that are mentioned a lot in the doc. And then of course, Truth and Comedy, which is his big book. So anyone who's watching this, if you want to read his book, you can get it for free at the Rocky River Public Library. Uh, they're kicking off their summer reading programs for kids and adults right now. And they've been partnering with the Cleveland International Film Festival for I think five years. And a lot of the older films from previous years are now available to be watched through the library via Hoopla, um, Acorn, and Canopy, which are all great streaming services you can get just from your library membership. So with that out of the way, now you know about us, tell us a little bit about yourself and your background. Well, I've been making documentaries for a while now, I think since, oh my God, 20 years. That's upsetting. But um <laughs> We, uh, yeah, I had done a lot of different kinds of films. Um, you know, I'd produced other people's films. I've directed my own films um, and done a lot of TV. Um, and I was, you know, my previous work had been a little bit more on the social justice end of things, um, and which I, I loved, but I was also looking to do something that was a stretch creatively. And I, um, you know, throughout my life, I've been such a huge comedy nerd. And when I was in Chicago making this other film about um, girls who, like teenage girls who were locked up in prison, it was super heavy, but they, the girls were so funny. And the comedy scene in Chicago, which is where I moved to to make the film, was so rich and, you know, it, and then I started hearing about Del Close and it was this like perfect stew of darkness and comedy history and sort of secret, secret cultural histories. And it, it seemed, and with the creativity and weirdness of Del himself, I was like, well, what a great um, subject to use to kind of explore some of these ideas and non-traditional ways of making a documentary. And, you know, let's see if we could actually make a documentary that's funny. Um, and, and it's really funny. Like this plays like a comedy. I watched it twice and it was just hilarious both times. Oh, that's such a great compliment. Thank you. Yeah. Um, speaking about your background with other films, I watched Baby Mama High oh, after cool. watching this documentary. And yeah, like you said, like a lot more of like a serious social ju justice documentary. And it seemed like your other work was a lot like that too. So it makes sense going to Chicago, you got into the comedy scene, why you switched to something like this. But how is that different um, as a documentarian going from something that you're sort of dealing with the person that's the subject, you know, face to face, as opposed to someone who's been passed away for a lot of years and just right. the subject matter being so different as well. Was that like a difficult transition? It was it was a little difficult because, you know, and I think I loved making Verite films, you know, and just like following and being a fly on the wall and, and like being led into people's lives and I still think that so many of those types of documentaries are super exciting because you can for a split second kind of like really identify with somebody um and and that's pretty magical but I also 
And my priority when I was making those films was to like really put myself away, you know, as much as possible. Like you pretend you're not there. You're trying not to give them any ideas. You want them to just be sort of purely them. And then when you're editing it and writing it in post, you also don't want to be putting your stuff all over somebody who, you know, that's not the point of verite. You want to let their inner life out. Yeah, have them sort of tell their own story. Yeah. Yeah. And also like, you know, I, I'm a white lady, to, you know, and, and, I, I don't want to like be prioritizing my POV. I want, I always like for the other films I made, it was really important for me not to have like the, you know, the standard sort of at the time, you know, white voice of authority. And, you know, I just wanted it to really be, you know, driven by project. So, and that involved a lot of like putting myself away and putting my own thoughts and ideas away. So, which was the right thing to do for those. But then, you know, as happens, you, you know, as a creative person, you want to do more. So I think, you know, with Dell, I was like, this is a guy who told tall tales his whole freaking life, you know, like, he was so much more excited about the idea of like the emotional truth. I don't want to give anything away about the film. But, you know, he would describe and tell stories from his life. And sometimes they were true. And sometimes they weren't. And, but they were always really true in, in a way in, in how in, in that they described something he was thinking about or going through so I thought I'm gonna do this documentary and I'm gonna take the tack that I'm gonna tell the emotional truth and I'm not gonna be super hogtied to you know whatever um you know was the scientific fact of, of of this person's life and then of course you find that it's easier said than done because even though he's been passed away for 20 one years now, um, you know, there are people who knew him and there are people who loved him and people who hated him and people who like, there are t huge amounts of people who are very deeply invested in his legacy. Was he a hero? Was he a villain? You know? Um, so in nonfiction, I don't think you can ever get away from uh, the subject. They're going to be stalking you through your dreams and through the whole process um, the whole time. And, you know, it's, it, it, it was fun to take some flights of fancy with Dell, but at the same time, you know, you, you, you have to honor or make a decision whether to honor somebody else's experience of, of Dell close. You know? Yeah, I, I think you do a really good job of that with the documentary because there's a lot of points where he's not shown necessarily as like a great person. Like a lot of people revere him, but there are times where he's manic or kind of mean and you sort of, that comes across really well without saying like he's one type of person, good or bad. Um, so that's always great. I've got one more question and then I'm going to open it up to and everyone else will go around and get some more questions in. But whenever I watch a documentary about a person's life, I'm always interested in like how the filmmaker condenses that, especially when they've only got 90 minutes. Like if you're doing a Ken Burns thing and you've got 20 episodes, you could cover everything. 90 minutes, you got to choose how to frame it. And I thought it was really interesting that you focused on these DC Wasteland comics, which are like pretty hard to find. Like I wasn't aware of it at first. I finally tracked down um, a digital copy of the first one and was able to read it but it was like not easy. So the fact that one, you chose it as a framing device was interesting, but also since it was just kind of so niche, even for Del Close was um, kind of fascinating. So why'd you choose that as what you've kind of based the narrative around? Well, you know, there was a practical reason and a creative reason. Like the practical thing is this guy mentored all these really famous people, but he was not famous. And the, you know, there aren't, you know, it's not like if I was doing something about Mike Nichols, we have, you know, 15 films and, you know, a thousand interviews and, you know, red carpet footage and everything else. And for Dell, we had like, you know, we kept finding little bits and pieces, but they were just really short and bad, not restored. And so we just didn't really have a lot of material. So we had to like, look and say, what do we have? Well, we have this like very fragmented autobiography that he wrote that we're going to use like a trail of breadcrumbs and like, you know, sort of each uh, story sort of like explore why he told that story and what it was speaking to about him. And so that became, you know, it became for us a little bit of a treasure hunt 
about like, why did he, you know, write about coleslaw in his pants? What was important about that? And, um, you know, so it was, it's creatively really fun and just super visual, um, you know, in a, 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 it was an opportunity that was, would have been hard to pass up, even if there was a lot of great material on him, because it's just super visual, super subjective, you know, it's like a weird way of getting to his interior, but in a very loud way. Um, so, so that was part of, of why. And the good news is that DC Comics will be re-releasing Wasteland. Ooh, uh, okay. <laughs> and they're going to launch it out of, they have a comic um, festival in, I believe, July. Um, and But they'll be re-releasing it for, for fans. And we can see <laughs> about this like strange, weird, it's oh, that's great. That they made while they were still cranking out Superman and everything else. So very cool. Well, that's exciting. Um, yeah, I do like what you did with the narrative that way because it made it very non-linear. Um, it kind of kept everything fresh and fun for each new scene. You didn't really know what was like the next step for what you were gonna kind of talk about. Um, but those were my biggest questions. Um, I'm gonna open it up to Beth from Rocky River Public Library. Um, Beth, whenever you're ready. It's all yours. Thank you. Hi, Heather. I'm Beth. I'm a librarian at Rocky River Public Library. Um, I'm First of all, thank you so much for telling me that they are going to be publishing Wasteland because that was one of our talking points earlier today is we're like, we, we were like, oh, hey, we should probably get this graphic novel or comic book, you know, even if it's like in an anthology for our collection because people are going to want to see it or read it after seeing this. And so that's huge news for us. So thank you. Right. Um, so one of, my question today is, did you find that people were really open to discuss with you how Dell influenced their comedy and lives, or were they more inclined to kind of downplay him? Most, for the most part, people were really interested in, in talking about his influence, you know, and I think we interviewed a range of people, some people who credit everything they are to his influence and others who think that he gets more credit than he should. Um, and we wanted that range. Um, but so, you know, and there were people we were so lucky to get like Bob Odenkirk, who I don't think had really, he's not a known improv, you know, he does some improv, but he's a comedy writer and actor. So um, he was effusive in saying like, I would not be a comedian if I didn't like run into Dell that day and spend an afternoon you know, with his, in his disgusting apartment, hearing him talk about his life, um, you know, and people like Adam McKay were, you know, they, they've told stories about Dell their whole lives or Matt Walsh from, you know, UCB. Um, yeah, they, they are very effusive in their, um, the tribute they, or, and, and um, Tim Meadows for sure. Um, also attributed like, pretty much his biggest break to Dell. I mean, and it was just like going to Second City. It wasn't even like a TV or movie break, but that was to him was, you know, the the moment that things opened up for him and it was, and he held Dell in really high esteem. Um, so, you know, and then it, the people that hated him, hated him and loved talking about how much they hated him. So that was fun too. Yeah, he really did seem to have a really strong pull on people, you know, one way or the other. Absolutely. And I think sometimes they were, you know, I, for a while we were like, is this guy, you know, does he, is he saying something or is he just catching people at a time in his in their lives when they're really open and young? Um, but, you know, the more we started sort of incorporating some of his ideas um, into the filmmaking and into the work and we still, I still work with the same writing partner. I just got off the phone with him and we still use these ideas of like escalating each other, you know, we never shut each other down. We always try to push each other, you know, as far as possible. And that is a hundred percent from Dell. That's awesome. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. I, uh, I think that yes and concept is like really big of everything else that they teach in improv that always seems to be like kind of the aha moment. And I think that comes through well in the doc. But did you try any improv like to kind of get yourself into the headspace for this? I did. I took, you know, I am very much not a performer, um, but I took 
a couple classes because I was like, I got to know what this is about. And I took it at um, IO, which is a theater that he co-founded. That's uh, um, Improv Olympics, right? Yeah, Improv Olympics. Okay. So, um, uh, I, yeah, so it, and it was, I'll say this, the first one was amazing. I think everybody should take one improv class um, because it was like, uh, I feel like oftentimes in the performing arts or even any part of the media, there's so many no's, you know, and, oh, you can't do that. Or, oh, you have to have your inciting incident on page three or, you know, like there's so many rules and so many people telling you you're not going to make it or this doesn't matter. And, you know, to be in a room where anything was okay, the more, the crazier, the better. And, and to be like up there in the moment, you don't know what to do. You just do something stupid and it gets a laugh. Like what a great validation of something, you know, where you're like, I don't have to try that hard. Maybe it's just, I can just be my weirdest self and something about that speaks to people. Um, so that was super liberating. And then when I went to the second one, that was a little bit more people who were real comedians trying to hone their craft. And I was like, okay, I'm out of my league, but mm -hmm. I still learned a lot. Cause, um, you know, I think any writer should do improv. I was just telling somebody that in that class, the teacher would look at how I did scenes and she like took me aside afterwards and she was like, you don't have to solve everyone's problem. And it was such an incisive comment about like, not only my life, but like artistically, right. too. like you don't have to make it better. Like let your characters get into trouble, let them figure it out. You know, you can't. Don't yeah. Like when it's right, it'll happen. But in the meantime, yeah. just kind of like live in it. Yeah. Yeah. And not try to save and, and make things neat and tidy. Like the more, they have to deal with the better, you know, like, I think he says, you know, we all like um, to watch people in peril, you know, um, it's more interesting to see someone, you know, that's what a structure of any TV show or movie really is, is like somebody getting in, in a fix and needing to get out. So um, mm. that was a good lesson. That's great. I'm glad you got the experience of it, of both the experiences of one doing well and then the other kind of bombing. Yeah. So I think those are both really important to get you into the mindset you got a bomb. You yeah. got a bomb. <laughs> uh, next, I've got uh, Kate up. She is with the Cleveland Comedy Festival. Um, okay. Hi. Hey. Do you feel uh, that you told the story of Del Close and his impact on comedy or the story of Del Close, a neurodiverse comedian, and how his specific diversity influenced his comedy and connection to the comedy scene? Can you ask that again? So it's like Del Close, the um, as a figure in the history of comedy versus Del Close as a creator. Correct. And like okay. how his neurodiversity played a part. Like, right. You right. I mean, I feel like it is largely a character study um, of somebody who was, as you say, yeah, very um, neuroatypical. Um, and how that uh, really informed his journey and made him someone who could see possibilities that other people couldn't. And, um, you know, but also how he really, you know, to me, he ended up being like, almost like an embodiment of the creative process, an extreme embodiment of the creative process. And, you know, the... Um, you know, he was literally inventing a new art form. Like, you know, for most of us, it's hard enough to invent a story or a picture or a, a stand-up act, you know? So he was, you know, he was doing it writ large. Um, but, you know, as this one scrappy guy without a lot of backing. So, you know, we really see the struggle of someone trying to like make something exist that doesn't exist. And that, you know, the, incredible amounts of disappointment that can come with that, the incredible hard work, you know, the fact that it's much easier to just live a normal life and not, you know, try to live a creative life. Um, but that if you need to do it, you need to do it. And um, that sometimes it pays off, even if it doesn't pay off for you. Um, you're adding something to the conversation. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think 
I and, and then the the comedy history part of it is was always like a, a sort of B story to me. Like um, it was definitely a way in because I love you know I was like we got to talk about Elaine May and Mike Nichols and <laughs> you know Amy Poehler and Bill Murray. Um, so that it was you know um, it was super fun to dip into all those chapters and find how he was like kind of every you know seminal comedy moment, but the driving force was him as a character um, and as a person. Does Thank that answer you. the question? Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, what we saw the, I know we talked about it a little bit before you jumped on about how um, visually it was done in like a way that seemed like it was neuroatypical, like the storyboard almost, uh, which really matched with him. And so that's why I was wondering if you, if you felt strongly that you just told like, oh, this guy, is a historical figure in the comedy scene or if it was uh which i that's what i got out of it that that was yeah he did that and this is like more of the creative pro like he like you said the embodiment of a creative process an unchecked one yeah exactly what you put it so well <laughs> yeah and the style had to reflect that fragmented way of thinking that he had um and the sloppiness of it and the fast paced of it so um Yes, thank you for putting it more eloquently. <laughs> <laughs> now, Heather, just kind of on the topic of um, Del being sort of a neuroatypical personality type, when you were doing, you know, improv yourself and trying that out and just interviewing other comedians, were you kind of noticing similar behaviors and personality types from the people you were now kind of surrounding yourself with? Or do you no, think it was more unique yeah. to Del? Well, here's the thing. I mean, I, and, and, I sort of wish we could have dived into it more in the film, but there was, you know, he, like you said, it's, it's really hard to boil it down, but mm -hmm. you know, I think that like any art form needs the buttoned up types and the, the wild, you know, neuroatypical imaginations. Cause though they're going to blaze the trails, you know, but then they may not be able to hone it into something that can speak to, the masses so and I think that's why we have you know I think that's when you interview people like Tim Meadows like you know um Bob Odenkirk like you know um Jason Sudeikis like these people are organized success you know to get that level of success most of the time there's a level of organization and ambition and, you know, I think Ike Barinholtz at some point was like, you know, it's easy to say, you know, comedians are, are crazy, but like Tina Fey is not, you know, crazy. Amy Poehler, you know, these people have, you know, jobs and lives and kids and, you know, things. So, mm -hmm. um, and then once in a while you get a, a, a wild one like Jason Manzoukas or, or someone who's like a little bit more on the edge in their demeanor, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, I think what I discovered is that there's like, you know, we need the people like Dell who hang out on the edge and they don't, you know, mind, they, they like that, they thrive on that. They don't need some of the comforts that other people need. It always gave me like a vibe similar to Andy Kaufman where they're just yeah. like, I'm going to do this thing and I don't care if anyone else gets it, but I yeah. get it. Yeah, just like, fully exploratory and like maybe a little bit dangerous and um, maybe disasters lurking around the bend, <laughs> but he's willing to do it. And then he's going to bring some, you know, it's like a hero's journey thing. He go, comes back with this truth that he's discovered and uh -huh. now these other people can hone it and massage it and mold it into something, you know, like a Ted Lasso or a, you know, SNL or whatever it is to that, um, you know, really speaks in a language that more people can understand. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good perspective of it because that comes up a lot too, is just how he was building these ideas and showing how modern comedy was affected by it and what it sort of um, became. So yeah. that's definitely a good outlook on it. Yeah, and you see it in other art forms, too. you know, music, there's always amazing musicians that are beloved by all the bands that you've heard of, but most people have never heard of, you know, like a Graham Parsons or, you know, that's a bad example because a lot of people have heard of them, but there's, you know, people who are the more obscure artists, but they, their influence is, is, you know, 
beyond uh, compare. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Um, next, I've got Mary from the Rocky River Public Library. Mary, you're muted right now, so. Hello, sorry about that. Can you get my mouse on to unmute me quick <laughs> enough? <laughs> oh, you're good now. Okay, thank you. Thanks for being here. I love the film. It was really interesting. Um, so I, you have touched on this quite a bit. Um, you had talked in the film about his improv called, the, they called it at one point, The Herald. And I was wondering if you, as, um, as the director, felt that that was reflective of his personal life. And The Herald, if, was that something personal that he that he brought to, to improv? Um, yeah, I think it, it, it was. I think his, um, and it was, it's very hard to describe, but I think his vision for The Herald was, you know, at that time, comedy was, you know, like, uh, take my wife, please. Or it was little sketches that were done at a nightclub you know, um, I guess like there's probably like the Tonight Show and, and you know, stuff like that. But um, it was definitely not seen in the realm of art. It was, you know, something to, to you know, take a load off and, and make you giggle and it has nothing to do with regular life. And I think he saw with the idea of a herald that improv comedy in general and improv in particular could be this more novel-esque thing that's like a, elevated to the realm of art um, that it didn't have to be just like a one-off punchline but you create these characters and you create this world and you do it on the spot and if you do it right you are going to be creating something on the magnitude of a, of a great play or a great novel um, so I think that was sort of what he that was his sort of aha moment but he never like as he went about trying to make that happen, he never really could. He got a glimpse of it and then he couldn't totally make it happen because it's really hard to get up with six people or eight people and have nothing planned and get up there and make anything anyone wants to watch. You know, it can be fun for the performers, but like, you know, before there was any training ground or any idea what they were doing, it was like hellacious for the audiences. So the, um, you know, I think what what worked was when he met like Sharna, who was like, "All right, let's put some rules on it. Let's put some format onto this," because um, you've been scooting around trying to make it this amorphous thing for so long, and you know, developing philosophies. But like, let's just give people a little roadmap. You know, Act One, Two, Three, basically. Um, not be afraid to put some you know shackles on it for a minute, and then within that. Um, one, two, three, you know, it's basically like a three act structure that escalates. Um, people can be as insane as they want to be, you know, and just pulling out any idea that they want and be, you know, and, and so that you always know, you don't have to waste time figuring out, oh, where do I go from here? You are programmed to sort of say, okay, I know I'm going to take that idea and escalate it in, in the next moment. Um, and, and that's when it became really watchable and really fun to do because you didn't have to reinvent the wheel every single time. So do you see that his method, um, the Herald and his method of improv, is that um, relevant, very relevant to improv that's going on today? I think it is. I think the idea of, you know, and I think there's sort of two ways of in understanding improv. There's like the improv we see in like Curb Your Enthusiasm, um, or something like that where, you know, that is ad-libbing, you know, kind of is, is probably how Del Close would describe it, where you have um, an outline and you know what has to happen in the scene, but you're gonna be working it out in the moment. So there are definitely elements of, of discovery in there and spontaneity for sure, um, but it's a little different from the idea of the Herald where there is no, you, you literally have no idea what's going to happen. So, you know, that I think was his contribution. And I think it is incredibly influential um, in that I think it's where a lot of people cut their teeth now. I think that most people coming into 
the writing world, you know, like the TV and film writing world and performing world are having some basic knowledge of the Herald and using it as a tool to develop their voice and to develop the idea of, of you know, collaboration, you know, and I think it's actually changed writers rooms for the better, you know, instead of everybody trying to like elbow each other out of the way, I'm sure that still happens, but you have, you know, I, 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 you see a lot more writers rooms now that are super collaborative and super, you know, Hey, we're all going in the same direction. Let's just make each other better. Um, and yeah, I think that the effect, even if you don't, the average person doesn't go watch a Herald, you know, on Saturday night, but they are, we're continuously reaping the war rewards of that work. Does that answer the question a little bit? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Now, what was your opinion of like how he came up with the name, the Herald? <laughs> like, cause that to me always drove me insane. Uh, when I first heard about it, I tried to apply so much like meaning to like why it could have been named that. Oh my God, and, it's like the most meaningless thing. Yeah. So, he, so I guess what happened was, um, you know, they did this thing and it sort of magically became this moment where everyone was in sync and everyone's participating and, and, and performing this long piece that was totally uh, improvised. And afterwards, everyone just wanted to go about their business. He was like, oh my God, this is amazing. We just kind of broke new ground. Um, and, you know, somebody said i guess there was a, a line in hard day's night where somebody asked like ringo star what he called his haircut and he said harold so <laughs> one of the other comedians in the troupe just said oh let's call it harold you know um just to kind of mess with dell mm -hmm. um, and his enthusiasm so it is like the most meaningless name for anything um and there's yeah there's no people think it's like harold h-e-r-a-l-d like you're that's what i always like assumed at first too yeah no it's just like your grandfather's name yeah <laughs> yeah no that's perfect that's something so kind of like esteemed now is actually just like a meaningless filler yeah it's so. like the perfect comedy uh mm -hmm. you know meaningful and meaningless at the same time right um, let's see, we've got one more person and then we'll kind of do another circle with more questions if anyone has them. But um, from the Cleveland Comedy Festival, we've got Amanda Averill. Uh, hi, uh, thank you so much for, for doing this and thanks to the library for putting this on as well. Um, excited to be here. Uh, my question is, uh, I feel like in comedy we have a tendency to uh, sometimes occasionally like martyr those who are um different uh or extraordinary in like their own type of way and that definitely uh Dell was one of those people um whenever you came across your research for this project did you find that in the people who worked closely with him because to be entirely honest I've worked with people who got to study under him and who've worked with people who like knew him and things like that. So I'm just kind of very intrigued at like the perception of him, both intern internally in like comedy as well as externally, because I feel as comedians, sometimes we have a tendency to hoist people up on these pedestals and make them more mythological than anything else. Yeah, I think, and there's always a danger in that. I mean, there were a lot of things he got wrong. He was, you know, he didn't foster the talents of a lot of women. Um, you know, we know now the years of it being like, you know, a white dude's game on stage is, you know, like had a lot of impact in who we see in the greater comedy landscape out there and the kind of stories we're telling. And thankfully things like that are changing. Um, and we know that there are times when he was um, in his addictions and, you know, having some wild ideas that were, didn't have a lot of meaning or a lot of, a lot to take from. So, you know, and it, it, you could make a hundred different films about him and because people really, he's kind of like that kaleidoscopic kind of person where if you had him at a certain time in your life and his life, it might have you know, really sent you right to the top. And if, but you, you know, like there were people who were pretty candid of like, 
you know, later in his life, he was not that interested in, in improv anymore. He was interested in like watching, you know, Korean sitcoms and, you know, he, he, he had a ton of interest. And like, I think it's really cool that the library is co-sponsoring this because he was an, a, in, you know, just like a um, voracious reader who had, you know, all over his house and really felt like you needed to consume as much um, uh, life and, and reading and, and, you know, to add to your comedy. But um, yeah, he's, I think that it doesn't do anyone any good to put someone on a pedestal. And I, I, I hope we don't do that in the film. I hope we tell the story of a, a guy, a person, you know, and not a legend, um, you know, and that, because I think we're now at a point with him in particular and a lot of other figures where we have to take what, well, you know, you have to take what's useful to you and, and from their life and their teaching and, and leave other things behind that you don't agree with or you didn't like. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's sort of part of creativity being a, a mystery. I think sometimes when people make great leaps, it seems almost superhuman to us and, and we want to reward that and be in awe of that. But I hope Dell is an example of someone who did make great leaps and also had a lot of problems. <laughs> yeah, I think you did a good job of showing him as someone who was very human. Uh, definitely like a lot of the tall tales came across, but there was also a lot of people interviewed that sort of call him on the tales being fake or at least heavily exaggerated. Yeah, yeah, for mm -hmm. sure. Were there any stories about Dell's life that like you found interesting, but they were just like too much to add to the documentary? Whether they were just like so far from real or just not fitting the vibe of the documentary itself? Well, we had a, a great bunch of stuff toward the end of the film that we ended up cutting um, just because it was a lot to come in uh, at the end of the film with, but he had a relationship with L. Ron Hubbard in his youth. That was really interesting. Um, where so do they actually know each other? Cause I know that was kind of touched on. And I was like, well, that's like, there's no way any of that's true. <laughs> oh, it's, it's pretty true. The oh my gosh. I went back and documented that. Yeah. Actually, L. Ron did live in the same town as this girl Dell had a crush on and he would ride to like the train to go see her and then stop off at, at Elrond's house. And this was when, this was pre-Scientology, but like maybe mm -hmm. like early seeds of it. And so he sort of joked that he, you know, gave, El, you know, Elrond the idea of like starting, you know, just start a church, then you don't have to pay his, your taxes because you know, <laughs> it's anything about him paying too many taxes. So I don't know. I mean, that's probably going a bridge too far, but he, um, it was an interesting, and actually, yeah, I, um, we had a segment where we dealt with um, that story and put it in the context of Dell become graduating to the role of mentor to other people, particularly Chris Farley. And we explored that story because, and that was, I'm, oh, I feel so sad. We'll, we'll try to dig up some, some extras to, to put online, but um, yeah. So there was, you know, he had a really tight relationship with Chris Farley um, that was, you know, a little bit problematic um, in, in how he pushed Chris, who was pretty neuroatypical as well. Um, and uh, yeah, that was, that was, that was one that I, I didn't love to, to leave on the cutting room floor, but. Um, I mean, that might know. be good for like a short documentary if you want to do another 20 or 30 minutes and just put that out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that sounds fascinating. Yeah, yeah and, and that whole section was about the danger um, uh, of mentorship, like kind of a little bit speaking to what Amanda said, but you know, the danger of, um, you know, putting yourself in some, in a guru's hands and, um, the amount of, of power they can, they can wield. That's not always healthy, um, <laughs> when we're learning. So, um, I'm trying to think of other stuff. I mean, there was, we tried to hit the, the greatest hits of his life, but, um, he did so much. He like, you know, 
he was obsessed with serial killers and I think he corresponded with uh, Gacy, you know, like he was ah, just a very odd guy. Um, there, yeah, you, there will be some some extras that, that we'll release at some point. Are you like kind of relieved to sort of be done studied now at this point? It sounds like that's a lot to like take on. It was, I mean, yeah, I was living with this character for many years and it is a, a bit of a relief to to move on i mean you know it's it's you, it's, it's mirrors probably what some of his students have gone through where you study with someone and you absorb them and you try to you know you go through love and hate with them and then you kind of are ready to to take what you learned and leave the rest and, and go your own way so you know, yeah, that's probably where, where I am now. Yeah. But um, I'm so grateful that I got to, you know, take a little roller coaster ride through his life and that I got to meet so many fantastic, interesting people um, through him. Mm -hmm. That's great. Um, I'm going to kind of go around one more time. So if anyone has like an extra question, we'll get that in. I know we got to wrap up soon. Um, Beth, did you have any other, other questions you wanted to ask? Well, I just wanted to maybe follow up with what you were saying, Heather. It sat like the, the list of people that you got to interview for this and that touched and influenced Dell's life was, it was so impressive. Uh, was there anyone that you wish you could have also added to the interviews that for some reason you were not able to include? Yeah, I really wanted to talk to Elaine May, um, who is sort of, she was, she was half of Nichols and May. She was a seminal comedian in the, in the 50s and 60s and was one of the most, you know, interesting female directors in the, you know, in the 60s as well. Um, totally uncompromising in her vision um, and brilliant. And then just sort of um, decided to pack it in, not pack it in, but, you know, she's actually performing on Broadway now, but she kind of had it and, and left Hollywood for a long time. And um, I really wanted to talk to her because she, she was a early friend of Dell. Dell was obsessed with her all his life. Many a hipster boy it continues <laughs> to be obsessed with her and I'm obsessed with her. Um, so I really wanted to talk to her. Um, and also Bill Murray, who, who doesn't want to talk to Bill Murray. So we we got really close. We got him on the phone and he was like, oh, that sounds interesting. I'll oh, you weren't him. stuck on the voicemail? Like you actually got to him? No, we went through all, oh my God. Oh I my gosh. Over that I could. And we actually <laughs> got him on the phone with, um, uh, I put up a, a sort of a friend of a friend who was a, a, a golf and comedy writer. So I, cause I figured they would have people in common and, and um, they had a chat and he was like, oh, Oh yeah, sounds good. I'll I'll call you back and as as he does, <laughs> he disappeared. But um yeah, there I mean there are any number, you know, like there's so many people now that are working, you know, I think there are people like um, you know, the Broad City girls and you know, people um, you know, Jordan Peele worked at you know, IO and can you know, I wanted to talk to more people that were current beneficiaries of that school, even if they didn't work with him. And at a certain point you have to like really just focus on the people who knew him, especially if it's a character study more than a comedy history piece. So mm -hmm. um yeah, I'll have to make another comedy <laughs> story to talk to those folks. Um Kate, did you have any more questions? Uh, just kind of following up with um, talking about Chris Farley and, you know, an atypical neurodiverse um, folks, because there's a lot of them in comedy and not just the straight, straight guys and straight women who get to keep it all organized. <laughs> but do you feel that because um, it's because you got to kind of go through the generations and everything? Do you feel that either the comedy in general or improv scene specifically does a better job? at valuing and fostering uh, neuroatypical folks than just using them 
lot or, or using them for inspiration or use, you know, the way that Del, it sounds like Del Close when he checked out for Korean sitcoms was just, you know, what I got from, at least what I would be like is, you know, I'm done teaching you people, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, like I got nothing more to say. You, you, you used it all. Um, do you feel that talking to like the, the younger generations or, um, and your own work in the Chicago scene and your, your few classes that, an atypical mind is not seen as like a pedestal, but it's actually like it's folks are treated with better accessibility and just seen as humans the way you try to and did, in my opinion, present Del Close. Thanks. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad um, you said that. And it's a great uh, question because I did uh, hear over and over that, you know, when people either got to Dell or got to the comedy improv scene, felt like they had found their people. And I felt like, you know, Dell was also looking for his people. And there's an element uh, where, you know, us atypical folk have an aha moment when we see people like us and a play and where, you know, you know, people like Sharna or, you know, some of these theaters that become homes and little covens for, um, you know, groups of people who, uh, think differently and have, have, have different ideas. And it can be, you know, I think it can be incredibly liberating. Um, and then there is the dark side of it where it's used like a natural resource. Like, you know, I think with Chris Farley, there was that element um, where he's a ball of fire and he's, you know, uh, so incredibly talented and yet he doesn't have, he doesn't put on the brakes. So he'll give you whatever you want, but nobody can go like that forever. Um, Belushi was like that as well, um, according to people who knew them both. So, um, and it's, it's hard. I mean, I think you see that more at the um, commercial level than you do at the um, per local performance level. Um, but when you, you know, at a certain point when you're performing, you have to turn on for an audience and, you know, and hopefully learn to turn off and keep something to yourself. And um, yeah, I, I guess it's, uh, it, it can be like a, a really welcoming family type environment and an, a, a, a great um, environment for people who, um, need to keep different hours or need to respond to people in, 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 in different ways than one would at an office. And, um, you know, there, there are a lot of ways where it's more possible to be yourself as a neurotypical person, um, in that world. But there is the not, you know, I think with any kind of performance and certainly at the heights when there's money and, um, you know, big groups of people involved, it can, it can, then the pressure can can become really difficult. I, I might be just inherent in 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 the performance medium. I'm not sure. Um, depending on how, uh, how you know how wide uh, an arena you're performing in. It's, I just I I pick. I don't even. I don't really even listen to her. But I every time like I think about performing or like um, you know in the field is Katy Perry during her documentary. Mm. where she got that text, a text message, I want a divorce and she's bawling. And she has this glittery outfit on with peppermint spinning, uh, like that have sparks on them over her boobs. And she just is bawling and her team is like holding her up. And then she steps on the little platform and she just all of a sudden like pulls up and just has this huge smile and gets and it. Like you see her just go away. And it's, and it's very, you know, like, I, I guess also on the audience's part, why do we expect, you know, I mean, everyone, if everyone is human, why do we expect, you know, oh, I paid for my ticket. I, I took this, I took today off work. I don't care that you're breaking down for me to have a good time. You know, and there's that social contract that seems like the entertainer kind of almost does, um, you know, sign themselves away and they cope with it in the ways that, that aren't always coping. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's difficult. And I think, you know, it can start from a place that's really wonderful where someone is responding to a performer because they do, they're atypical themselves and they're seeing 
a, a, a kindred spirit. Um, and then, but then sometimes as audience members, we do take it to the point of like, we want to consume that person, you know, we want to own that person in some way. We feel like we know them and we don't, you know, mm -hmm. so um, it's a, it is a really, um, yeah, you point to like a very uh, ironic truth about the um, creative world where it, the things that can attract very interesting, diverse people can also become issues and, and difficult. Mm -hmm. um, Mary, did you have any other questions? Um, you just real quickly, um, it, during the documentary, you had either the idea or you made the choice to have actors reenact the scenes about Dell writing Wasteland. So I just wondered, you know, why, why you made that choice. Um, uh, several reasons. I think you know, the big reason was that we um, had a lot of writing and recordings, audio recordings of Dell that were not good recordings. They were not very, you wouldn't want to have an hour and a half of those recordings. Um, and he was saying these wonderful, weird things that were very him. And so we wanted to make use of them in some way. And then we also wanted to play with improv. And so we thought, why don't we take these recordings and these real things that he actually said and put, you know, somebody saying them in a room with, you know, great improvisers and great comedians and see what they come up with. And it was not like a full herald at all. We knew kind of where the scene was going, but um, it was our way of sort of um, inventing a, a new improv form uh, and playing with some of, of Dell's ideas. And uh, yeah, uh, so that was, that, was, that was fun for us. Um, yeah, and then it's also like the idea of making these people your own, you know, like he was a person and he existed and, and um, but like, let's see him, how other people digest him and, 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 and play him as well. So that it was, it was fun to watch James work and, and, and do that role. It was, it was great. Thanks. It added a whole new dimension to it, you know, and I thought it was interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Amanda, do you have any more questions? Uh, I, I do. Um, just real quick, through the creative process of writing Wasteland or at any other point in his life, do you think that Dell painted himself a superhero of, of sorts for either comedy or theater and, or um, like in the way that like, he's working for DC, is he the Batman? Is he the Joker type of a thing? Uh, do you think that he ever felt that way? Uh, and additionally in your studying of, of Dell through this process, how did that affect um, your creative process? Yeah, I think it's the bringing up the idea of superheroes and superpowers is is fun. And um, I think that it was a really appropriate format for him because he did a lot of self mythologizing. And he, you know, I think that sort of originated with his students because he was such a character that they would start telling stories and then he would sort of start buying into them or enhancing them. Um, and but I, I think he would always want to be the bad guy, you know, I don't think he would ever see himself as, um, as the hero. Uh, um, there, yeah. And there's one that he does with his co-writer where the co-writer is sort of, um, the, the good guy and, and he takes on the, the sort of chaos maker role. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and then the second part of that was about how it, it impacted my creative process. Yeah. How did like watching, him go through the creative process of doing the things that he did and including like Wasteland, how did that affect your creative process? Yeah, I, it, it, it was a very Im impactful thing to be thinking about this over years. Um, it, it was a difficult film to make and I struggled with it. Um, and I think he, his story allowed me to explore the struggles that the creative process can have. And the fact that you don't know if you're gonna 
succeed when you set out. And if, you know, especially if you lay out a really ambitious trajectory, you may fail. And what are you going to take away from it if you fail? You know, I, I was, I like the idea that it was not that it, you know, is a lot about the pro, you know, he was so heavily about the process rather than the product. So I think that was a really helpful way for me to start thinking about my process and that, um, and also that I could put my own real self into something without feeling like I was um, not allowed to do that. Um, so that was really beneficial. And I, I think it was also really interesting seeing his look at how he, um, his relationship to fame and success in that he was the process guy. He was the messy guy. He was happy being that agent of chaos, but part of him still would have liked to have won an award or, or been recognized more. And um, so it was a good opportunity for, me to look at you know why do we make these things what how much of it is you know contingent on status or recognition and how much of it is real irrepressible creative urge so i it, it was it was really rich for me i hope it has some of that for for the audience as well well we've got a heart out soon so i'm gonna give you one more question and then you're free to go but uh like, I always hate asking people who just made something like what's next, because you just spent probably two years working on this and touring it. So I'm not going to ask you that. But um, given that you were doing a lot of these like social justice pieces before and now you have this character study going forward, is there uh, one that you think you're going to prefer to lean toward? Do you want to do more of these character pieces, whether they're about comedy or otherwise, or do you want to go back to like things that are focused on issues? I am working on two completely fictional projects right now. Um, they're both two, true stories, but they are completely written from top to bottom, and um, it, and I am loving it. Um, and I I, I don't want to. I feel like a documentary sellout, um, but I, um, you know, I think one thing that was really interesting in this process was looking at the interplay between true story and creative flights of fancy, and it really kind of lit a fire for me to to explore the flights of fancy part of it. Um, and, you know, I want to do it responsibly. I don't want to take someone's story and hijack it and make it something else that I want to do. So we, um, my writing partner on this and I sort of have been writing some, some comedy material that all has basis in, in um, history. Uh, one is the story of uh, this great literary hoax from the 60s where a group of Long Island newspapermen put out, they intentionally wrote the dirtiest, worst book uh, they could even conceive of writing. And um, they got it published and it became a hit. And it was all trying to take down like Jacqueline, Jacqueline Suzanne and the Valley of the Dolls. So um, that's a really fun one about sort of uh, culture wars and high culture versus low culture um, and the sort of gender dynamics that, that um, come out of that. So still true stories, but taken into the realm of, of fantasy. Mm -hmm. That sounds fantastic. So I'm sure we're all excited to see it. I know I'm excited to see what that turns out to be. Thanks. Um, yeah. Is there anything else anyone wanted to chime in with before we kind of call it? All right. Well, the film is called for Mad Men only and it's fantastic. So anyone who's watching this, um, Hopefully you've seen it already, but if you haven't, definitely watch it because it's probably one of the best documentaries I've seen at the film festival. It's hilarious from top to bottom and it's just fascinating the whole way through. Well, thank you so much for having me and for all these great, really thoughtful questions. I really appreciate it. Thanks for doing this. We appreciate it too. Take care. You too.